Imagine a world where you feel stuck. Stuck in a job that is mostly unfulfilling or has become unchallenging to you. Stuck in a relationship whose better days are clearly behind it. Stuck in a world that has become more paranoid to you than welcoming. Do any of these basic human challenges sound familiar to you? Are you feeling any of these right now? If given the opportunity to erase all those concerns and start over with all the knowledge you have accumulated, would you take that offer? Most of us in that circumstance probably would highly consider it, and some of us would. In this scenario, you would enter a world where you are coming back for seconds. In 1966, director John Frankenheimer had become a named director, with Birdman of Alcatraz, The Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, and The Train all under his belt. Hollywood knew John was not only a director, but a star director that actors wanted to work with. He now had some cachet, and with that, instead of being offered movies, he himself was looking for a chance to maybe even rebirth his own career in a new way. His perspective on America had also changed. After living overseas for about a year, during which time JFK was assassinated, he set his perspective on the American dream changed dramatically. He saw it as more of a tragedy. And it is here where Seconds appeals to him creatively, personally, and professionally. This cold, distorted film would also serve as the closer to his paranoia trilogy of films that began with The Manchurian Candidate, Seven Days in May, and now the last chapter, Seconds. Based on the 1963 novel by author David Eli, Seconds is unlike anything that had made it to the big screen at that time. The best way to describe this film to the uninitiated is imagine they made a Twilight Zone movie back in 1966. Exactly! Seconds tells the tale of Mr. Wilson, a middle-aged man who works by day as a board banker. Should your equity increase, do not hesitate to call on us for a personal reappraisal, etc., etc. At night, he adjusts to an exhausted, empty nester husband with a wife whom he would rather keep his distance from, not only physically, but to the point of separate beds. His life is a slow-moving nightmare that repeats day after day after day. Something wrong? No. One day, he receives a call from an old friend, Charlie, he thought had passed away, and he invites him to maybe reevaluate his life and decide if it was worth it to continue or to start all over with not only a new life, but a new younger face and a chance to reverse every wrong. I'm alive, more alive than I've been in the past 25 years. The novel Seconds was a passion of Frankenheimer's, according to his wife, Evans Evans. Evans was his third wife in 1963, so he himself had lived a sort of similar experience already to his protagonist, Tony Wilson. Evans went on to proclaim that John was fascinated with the concept of being able to start a new life, but still trapped by your past. The damaging memories from your past are still intact, and this is what fascinated Frankenheimer. He was a quiet man. I think the thing I most remember him for were his silences. As if he were always listening to something inside. With John Frankenheimer's success, he was able to successfully navigate this story into existence, although there were some compromises along the way. John's first choice to play Tony Wilson was Kirk Douglas. Douglas's production company was in fact producing the film. Douglas just could not find a hole in his schedule to play the part, so Frankenheimer offered it to Sir Lawrence Olivier, to which he accepted because of the opportunity to play both versions of Tony. However, Paramount Pictures, who had released the film, felt that he was not a big enough star, leaving Frankenheimer perplexed with whom to fill Mr. Wilson's shoes with. Given that the film was obtuse to begin with, they would need to counter that with someone who could bring in people at the box office. They suggested Rock Hudson, and Frankenheimer actually agreed. Frankenheimer then approached actor John Randolph to play the first version. This is also a genius piece of casting, given that Randolph was on the blacklist. This adds a deeper layer of real paranoia to Randolph's performance that otherwise would have just been seen as good acting. 
and Hudson, for his part, saw the role as a way for him to escape the so-called celebrity sphere into a much more serious actor. The opening credits by Saul Bass depict a face being distorted as we go inside a mouth, an ear, a nose. First time viewers might be put off by the series of warped images of a face being altered or rearranged, but in truth, this opening montage puts you in the unsettled mood you need to be for the duration of the film. The score by Jerry Goldsmith here is just pure perfection. It's literally an organ grinder score that is perfectly fitting given the images we are seeing on screen. On the surface, you might say that Frankenheimer and cinematographer legend Jimmy Wang Howe are simply showing off right off the bat in the Grand Central Station section, when in fact, these angles are ugly and off-putting. It's handheld, wides, zooms, actors actually wearing a camera harness on their body. It's just unsettling. Now, they may have been doing this to be cool and innovative with lenses normally not used, but they are also making you pay strict attention to these characters. Why is Mr. Wilson's life so tense when seemingly nothing is actually happening? It appears that he's dying inside, and all these crazy angles illustrate that something is wrong, but we, like him, don't realize what that is yet. Carsdale is next. The scene that might illustrate this point the most is also the one that hurts the most to watch. When Mr. Wilson's wife, played by Frances Reed, tries to make love with him, and he can't, not because he doesn't love her, he hates himself, and his confidence in everything is shot. His love for her is still there, but that love has evolved with raising children and life. It's not a romantic love any longer for either of them. They are going through the motions, but even those are now impossible to fake. I was told to. I was told to come here. When Mr. Wilson decides to investigate his friend Charlie's claim of starting life over, he has to stroll through several locations to get there. The laundry and the meatpacking place are interesting locations because they both are in the business of recycling something worn out into something new. And once Mr. Wilson is drugged, we enter a fever dream. He has fantasies of attacking a young, beautiful woman. One could take this dream in any manner of directions. He is obviously looking for someone to love, but he has forgotten what that even entails. He may be so incredibly desperate for love that his mind has told him that he will in fact have to just take it by force, or it's not even going to be an option in his current body and mental state. Features, dental structure. Fingerprints. See, we can't leave anything to chance. No, I, I guess not. The character of Ruby, played by Jeff Corey, is very straightforward with the company's terminology. He just lays it out very matter-of-factly while enjoying a nice chicken dinner. Mm, excuse me. Delicious. They, they have a wonderful way of baking cheese on it so that it gets very crispy. The very dark humor starts to emerge here as he tries to convince Mr. Wilson to destroy his own body while he's enjoying the flesh of another animal. If I may say so, the question of death selection may be the most important decision in your life. The company brings in the old man, played by Will Greer, to soothe any fears that Mr. Wilson may have about the process. You can't mean anything now anymore. There's nothing anymore, is there? Anything at all? Greer who's so perfect in his role as the southern nothing-to-fear-here guy, just comes in and confirms to him that your life is truly a disaster. By signing this release form, everything about your previous life becomes instantly better. These scenes are especially made tense by the fact that Frankenheimer and Howe insisted on using a 9.5mm lens to film both actors in frame and let the actors walk in and out of close-ups. In fact, Frankenheimer has even noted that this is one of his favorite scenes that he has ever directed. So this is what happens to the dreams of youth. 
Go on, son, let it out. Nothing to be ashamed of. Let it out. After a series of grotesque surgeries, which were in fact actual footage of facial surgeries, the audience now fully understands the depth of this character's true despair with life. It's a brutal reminder of how rare it was in the 60s to have this done, but now it's just a routine procedure. I'm not sure what this says about us as a society, or perhaps more of a country. I think it says something very similar to what David Lynch taught us in his film, Blue Velvet that below the blue skies and white picket fences and green grass, there is something dark and ultimately grotesque lurking that we keep mostly hidden. As Mr. Wilson sees himself in the mask, he sees himself for the only time in the film, perhaps as he truly is, a faceless, soulless man who has lost. It's a really heartbreaking scene to watch because we as the audience no, like he does, there is no going back now. This is his new reality. The Frankenrock reveal is a revelatory performance by Rock Hudson. What was once a dying banker in a hopeless marriage is now transformed into a mildly talented abstract artist living on the beach as a bachelor in Malibu. There is a little scene of the stewardess kind of flirting with him on the plane that recalls the fever dream from earlier. In his new reality, it actually scares the hell out of him that someone would be attracted to his new face, and as a result, he runs to the bathroom in fear. His previous center of gravity in his unconscious was to have to take it by force, but now it's freely reciprocated. Was this also a subtle nod to Rock's attitude toward his own fame at this time? Rock Hudson kept his private life very private until his death in 1985. Hudson's closest friends knew his secret, of course, but one has to wonder if Frankenheimer and Hudson both were using this role as a surrogate for many things, including Hudson's private life. To put oneself in Rock's shoes back then, it must have felt incredibly satisfying to be able to take this role as opposed to someone like a Kirk Douglas, who, like Hudson, was known for his manly man roles, Hudson's performance here is of a man trapped in another man's body, which in fact, that was his real life. This would not have connected in the same fashion had, say, Douglas did it. Welcome home, Mr. Wilson. My name is John. I've been assigned to help you. John is played by Wesley Addy and is the person assigned to be his servant and housemate. But moreover, he's there to solve any problems he may have, getting used to his new beginning. Mr. Wilson now finds stress in that he must fit into his new life, which also speaks volumes of the hoops Hudson probably had to go through in Hollywood. This puts this tale into a new perspective, but it remains in its dystopian wrapper. I'm Nora Marcus. I'm Tony Wilson. As Wilson meets Nora, played by Salome Jens on the beach, they talk about their previous lives and how they didn't fit in. She invites him to a party that's going to be pretty wild. Somewhere in the land, there's still a key unturned. And he replies, It's going to be very wild. Maybe that's part of turning the key. At this point, he's still repressing his true feelings. The grape crushing scene is basically an orgy, and for him, it really is. He's in totally foreign land here, and seeing such debauchery is shocking to him. She tells him to stop thinking and start feeling. Once he gets naked with Nora and everyone else and crushes the grapes, his life is transformed, at least for the time being. He finally feels accepted for once. <laughs> if you had to fault this film, it would be its second act. It feels very underdeveloped. Because Wilson's transformation into this new society just happens very quickly. And that's okay, but you would have liked to have seen a little bit more of how he entered into this new society. Honey, please slow down. Never! 
never. Come, I'm taking you to see Cosba. <laughs> At Wilson's house party, where he is completely wasted, Rock Hudson himself went method and insisted on being completely drunk for these scenes. We change sets. I beg your pardon. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you thought I meant sex, S-E-C-T. Oh, yes. sex! Yes. This is where Wilson starts to say things that allude to a past life, and the other seconds around him try to make him stop, to the point of dragging him into the bedroom and holding him down. As Wilson is surrounded by reborns, he expects Nora to come to his defense. Shut up! Shut up, damn you! Just who the hell do you think you are? Salome Jens as Nora said that she wanted to show that her character really loved him when he broke, but that Frankenheimer thought that she was too loyal to the company to do that. It sadly sinks into him that he has screwed up yet another life and another fake life at that. When Rock makes his way back to his previous home to confront his ex-wife, who believes he is dead, his wife tells her side of their marriage, but is able to do so because Wilson is no longer her husband here, but just a stranger. You see, Arthur had been dead a long, long time before they found him in that hotel room. And a stranger that she thinks is just one of his old friends. It's an incredible scene when you strip all the layers away. It's a brutally honest scene at that. I mean, he never let anything touch him. Became absorbed in things, his job mostly. He worked hard, he became more detached. Wilson now finds himself with his friend Charlie, working in the call center at the company. It reminds us that Wilson, who once walked past huge pieces of hanging meat in the plant, is now one of those pieces of meat hanging in the plant. He's being recycled now for someone else's benefit. Wilson recounts to the old man that maybe my problem is I never had a dream. The old man responds with the frosty reply of mistakes can't jeopardize the dream now. We have a board of directors. And we can't let the mistakes jeopardize the dream. When Wilson finally realizes his dream and how to accomplish it, it has come too late because the company has made a decision. In the final moments of the film, it's amazing to see Brock Hudson so unhinged. Ultimately, Mr. Wilson, ultimately we'll be called to face the creator and render up our last account. It happens to all of us, sir. That's no answer! I want to know what's happening to me now! Oh, it's like all the frustration coming to a boil. He gives everything he has in this scene. He's going out, and he said, thou canst not see my face. Although he's gagged, you know every single word that's coming out of his mouth. It's everything he's ever wanted to say, and Rock Hudson was probably saying a lot. Seconds is also a political film, that the national belief that second chances are available in America, and that the myth of the perfect suburban middle class is just that, a myth. His dream of rebooting his life as Tony Wilson, then rejecting even that life, is the horrible reality that many Americans seem to repeat into infinity. Mr. Wilson finds his quest for existential existence as an artist living on the beach to be as hollow and empty as his previous life. Frankenheimer has said that the message of the book and the film was that an individual is what they are, that they have to live with their life. They cannot change anything. And all the literature and movies about escapism are just rubbish because you cannot and should not ever try to escape from what you are. Your experience is what makes you the person you are. This remains a truly remarkable film and has grown in popularity over the years after being panned domestically and even booed at the Cannes Film Festival. It is a film that is overtly subversive in its very creation, from its off-the-wall performances, its tricky misdirections, and go-for-broke cinematography, it truly is a sight to behold. If removed from its time of release and unleashed now, it would be praised, but it would never become the classic it is today. 
those limitations of its day have now become its greatest strength. Frankenheimer would go on to make the more successful commercial film Grand Prix, which was released only two months after Seconds was, but he would never return to make anything as personal as Seconds. <laughs>